What's new in filmmaking technology this week? News, reviews, education, insights, opinions and ideas. From the CineD Newsroom. This is Focus Check, the weekly Cinetech podcast. Welcome. This is the first episode of our new podcast, Johnny. Here we are. Good luck to us. I'm so excited, actually. Really, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a dream that you personally had for a very long time. Well, actually, for a very long time, yes. I wanted to make something that ties our website more closely to the YouTube in a way. And then I was like, well, actually, it should be more. It should be a podcast. And out of my own habit of listening to podcasts regularly, I, I felt like there are not enough podcasts in our field, which is, of course, filmmaking technology, talking about the news, the reviews in our field, filmmaking education as well. There's not much out there. There are very few podcasts and a lot of them are outdated and it's not regular. And I thought it's, we publish what, four or five times a day on CineD.com. We have a large editorial team working on all the latest news. We do lots of reviews. We do lots of interviews as well with, you know, like we have a lot of connections to the camera and accessory manufacturers, but we never really talk about how these things happen and what we think about them. You know, we it's, it's 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 more about colorful. It's like to to paint our articles uh, in a brush that we couldn't do while writing the article itself or in doing a review. So this is very nice. It's almost like informal um, way to discuss stuff. And yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's a fest it's a festive day. That's how you say. It. It's very nice. I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah, it's it. We'll try this. You know, like we 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 might not get everything right. We will make mistakes for sure. Uh, we will, you know, not have every information correct all the time. But it's also a good way for the two of us to actually dive even deeper in the content that we publish. Because of course, there's so much out there that it's not always possible to be on top of everything. We try to be, but yeah. Um, but yeah, let's let's just get started. I mean, what's the last few weeks were very busy for us with traveling, especially for you. We both went to London for BSC Expo, which is a smallish show uh, in Battersea Park in London. I, I, just before, because you said it, it was uh, really busy for us. Between my wife and I, we have this joke. And when she's asking me, how was your day? I think for the last few years, she keeps hearing it was very busy. And how is how is tomorrow going to be? It's going to be even busier. Nothing new. It's it's literally, we put our lives into into this assignment. It's a marathon run for us. Cinedy.com, it's, it's like a, we give everything we can with our team together to bring... Th- really the the best out of us. Yeah. Well, so, maybe we should mention a little bit of history. I mean, for people that haven't, you know, there's a lot of people that haven't known the site for a very long time, but um, originally CineD was called Cinema 5D and it was founded, what, in 2008. So it's like the ancient times as of forum, the internet yeah. as a forum for DSLR filmmakers. We used to have a third business partner, Sebastian, who, who founded it together. Uh, with him, we, we made it big and made it into... A, a news and reviews site and and five years ago five years ago five years ago. five years ago when he said goodbye to the company we took it to the next level relaunched it into cinedy.com originally of course the 5d of cinema 5d came from the 5d mark ii which was the dslr camera that started it all that started arguably the the affordable filmmaking revolution Actually. for the wait, for the first time a camera with a full frame sensor that was, you know, in reach of people for what three thousand dollars, and you could generate video images. I mean, for all the young people, younger people hearing this now, they we sound really old now, but this is what changed a lot of things, and that's what made the film look on a budget possible. Actually, what many people are forgetting that the first camera to shoot video as a DSLR was Nikon. And it was the D... 90? No, seven, sorry. Nah. S- yeah, really. uh, n- 90 maybe? Maybe. Can't remember. They were the, actually the first one. It was only 720p, not full HD. And it was all automatic. You couldn't control anything. But they were the first one. And shortly after, it was the Canon 5D Mark II who uh, made it in a, in a full HD form. And of course, they took all the glory. Yeah. But anyway, this is history. It's really ancient history. And yeah. and of course, the site has con- changed completely since then. Um, and uh, of course, the industry has changed completely. Everything became in reach. I mean, it's now 
there, I keep saying that there are no bad cameras anymore, right? Like yeah. every camera you pick up now, every camera that's on the market is amazing in a way. And between us, it's about storytelling. Exactly. The equipment. And it's like, we still look at the technology, we talk about the differences and they are important, but it's becoming almost like, you know, finding the needle in the haystack and like finding mistakes in a way, because they are all amazing. I mean, you pick up a camera for, I don't know, five, six, seven hundred dollars, euros, and it's amazing. Yeah, in Kobe, very spoiled. It, it's very spoiled. And uh, uh, exactly. And that's why, you know, like the content is even more important. But anyway, that's that's a bit of a background. We might talk about more of this over the next years of this podcast, I guess. Um, but that's just a bit of history. Yeah. So let's concentrate. You Let, said let's concentrate. Let's let's focus. We, we want to, you know, like we have to look at the time as well. Of course, podcasts are a long form format. But still, we're, there's a lot of topics. This week, we want to talk about um, BSC Expo and CP Plus Expo. So BSC Expo, we went together. That was about two weeks ago. In London. In London, Battersea Park, very nice location. I've been there many times. It was your first time, I think. That's right. Um, it's it's nice because our, our main shows, in a way, like the main shows that Synity attends are NAB and IBC. I've always been. I think the two of us have attended... Every single NAB since the beginning and it IBC feels as well. Almost since I was born, honestly, that's how it feels. Yeah. It's crazy how many NABs and IBCs we have under, yeah, under the belt. Yeah, we we you know like I mean there's many, there's been many out, other outlets over the years, but we are I think the only ones that have been or one of the few ones that have really been covering every show since 2008. And we shoot a lot of videos there about new products and so on. That's what a lot of people know our site and also the YouTube channel for. Uh, but there, times have changed a little bit. There's a lot more smaller shows now as well. Especially after COVID. Exactly. All over the world. And the nice ones, are the ones that I prefer the most, are the ones that are really focusing on cinematography. That are, you know, like because NAB, IBC, a lot about broadcast technology, satellite trucks, and all, yeah, and all that kind of stuff, like networking and cloud stuff. And it's fine. It's relevant in a way for us. But we're by heart, I mean, we're independent filmmakers, directors of photography that want to shoot on a budget, beautiful images. And and um, those smaller shows are really about cinematography. Uh, BSC is one of them. It's, it's organized by or for the British Society of Cinematographers and all the people you meet there are either cinematographers, assistants and so on. It, it's small, it's nice. Yeah. There's not so many news in a way, like new technologies, but it's like a great meeting yeah, it's event. One, one big room. Actually, it was really nice to be in London again. Again, And the weather was quite okay. Gray, but okay. <laughs> and um, it's a very nice show. I mean, it's, it's one big room and it's very easy to meet people. It's very easy for the local audience to come and see the new technology. So our aim was not really only to cover the show per se. We did two videos that we're going to talk uh, in a second, but it was, first of all, meet a lot of friends that we haven't seen for uh, quite some time. A lot of colleagues discuss new ideas. You know, one of the, thing, one of the things for us at Synergy is always to move forward. We're always thinking about new ideas and many things are happening behind closed door and when they will materialize, we'll be able to share it. But that was another another step forward when uh, with meeting people. But we made two videos. I think we're going to talk about, well, we can talk about both, but which one do you want to talk about there? Actually, uh, one of the subjects that we covered was anamorphic, anamorphic zooms from Laoa. Mm. And I think they are the first ones to introduce... Affordable. Affordable ones. Uh, yeah, which is really nice. And the, uh, the Indiegogo campaign will go live very Tomorrow. soon, I think. Uh, I will. March. When people hear this, they probably yeah, March, March first. first yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's an anamorphic, it's two anamorphic, sorry, it's That's two right. anamorphic zooms actually uh, that are, I think, the same focal length as their nanomorph zooms? I or? can't really remember by, by <laughs> heart because yeah. you know, we're dealing with so many things. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm impressed with Laoa in general. They always try to find a certain niche mm. that nobody really did before or uh, try to tackle and anamorphic zooms in general were requested by creators for so long, uh, especially if it's on the budget and relatively compact, and they did it. Yeah. The owner of the company, Mr. Lee, is a very ambitious person. 
He was, I think, with Tamron for many, many years in the past, and until he decided to move on and do uh, his own stuff, yeah. And uh, together with his team, uh, led by uh, Kevin, I think they're doing really a great job. Um, let me just look here. I mean, people who are watching this on YouTube, they can sometimes see what I have on screen, just for people to explain that are listening to this uh, through a podcast um, service. Uh, I'm just looking for uh, the interview we made, actually. Now, I have to compare it. I reviewed uh, recently the Laua Ranger zooms, which are spherical zooms, very nice zooms as well, very sharp. Uh, our, the review is on our site. We put the link in the show notes. Um, but in terms of size and weight, they are very, very similar uh, to the new nanomorph zooms. Uh, they are a little bit different in terms of focal range. You see the ranges are 28, 75 and 75 to 180, whereas the nanomorphs are 28 to 55 and 50 to 100. But it's of course different because the field of view is different on anamorphic. And we were even thinking if it's kind of a rehoused yeah. glass within the same body and we reached out to, to clarify not. this and it's not, yeah. which is nice. So it means again, there were literally building those lenses from scratch. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, you know, we haven't had affordable anamorphic zooms so far. It's not so easy, you know. It's not so easy. It's not so easy. I'm sure. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in that interview and to go more into detail about those nanomorph zooms, you can watch it on our site. We'll also put the link in the show notes. Um, Annie from, from Laua gave us a nice rundown of those lenses. Yeah. And in the future, when you guys get the lenses and when you work with them, it would be really nice if you drop us a note just to do, just that we know how do you like yeah. those lenses. It's, um, it's, it's in we might review them, but we don't know yet, yeah. but uh, it's like we, you know, like we have only touched them the first time at BSC, so we can't give any quality assumption yet. That's so right. uh, the second thing we talked about, uh, the second video we made at BSC was about an iPhone app. Uh, it's called Jet Set by a company called Lightcraft. Now, this is something we're both not so familiar with. That's right. I mean, they are cooperating together with Axun. And we are uh, really familiar with Axon's uh, products, which are like more like wireless uh, devices. So they're working together on this. But as you said, in all honesty, all of this kind of virtual reality or... Uh, yeah, virtual of, production, e yeah. Exactly. We are... We are, we are I well, think we are, we are filmmakers. You know, we need, we need to touch the thing and we need to see the things that are really in the frame. But it is something that a lot of people get excited about. And I try to explain it. So basically it's an iPhone app with a live camera tracker. So I, when I was in film school, we still, you know, like for tr having tracking points, you needed to put points somewhere uh, that you kind of needed to define in your post-production software that this is the point A, this is the point B, th C, and then it sees it basically moving and it renders through every frame. And then the the program understands the movement now in this this day and age um the software can do this automatically so basically as soon as you move a camera it will understand the relation of objects in space and do auto tracking yeah. that means it can also put stuff on a certain surface now this app does this in real time on the blue screen i think also green screen um but the cool thing is it's not only inside the app. Well, it's real time, which is amazing because this takes a lot of processing and modern iPhones have a very, very capable processor, sometimes more capable than a camera. Uh, and you can put any software on it, uh, which you cannot do on a camera. Um, that's why they use a phone. And then you put this phone on top. I can actually play the video in the background here. Uh, so this is what it looks like. You can... You, you have the see. phone on top of the um, on top of a cinema camera, and I'll just move here a little bit. Of course, yeah. you can. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll show the whole. We, you can. We'll put the link in the show notes for the whole video. So basically, you see this woman here in a green screen setup, very messy setup actually, but doesn't matter uh, because it it works as well. And uh, Joshua, I think is his name. He has an iPhone here on top of a cinema camera. And this iPhone is connected to a Axun Simo. And 
you get so basically what it does it calculates the offset from the cinema camera image that it's recording internally and records that to the iPhone and then in post uh, you can use the cinema camera image and use the tracking data and the positioning of the data in uh, of the phone in space because of course thanks to the gyroscope and everything that the phone has built in uh, the phone knows exactly where it is in space the camera does not but you transfer that data from the phone to the cinema camera and then you can put that data on top so what we see here is actually the preview i think from the from the iphone uh, but you will be able to combine this with with the cinema camera that's kind of amazing because it makes the whole process very cheap there have been other solutions on the market from ncam and many others that that do this as well but it's much more expensive and more cumbersome in a way and i think it's important to say that for now this is an uh, ios solution only you can't yeah. really do this on android they also have a demo video which um i think we have linked here where they show this you know together with a very famous movie from hitchcock uh north by northwest and they combine this guy into this setting and you can kind of mimic this. I mean, it's 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 really impressive. So uh, it's the beginning of something for sure <laughs> that we have to start following. Yeah, it's also not that expensive. Yeah, I think um, it's eighty dollars a month or something for the cinema version, and it's free for the iPhone, as far as I know. Uh, it's yeah. But it's in, anyway, I think it's uh, if you're interested, you will find much more information in uh, in the article that we we wrote. So tell me about CP Plus. After we came back from London two days later, you flew to Japan. Yeah, I had one day with the family to say hi and goodbye. And I went to Japan. And as many of you know, Japan is like a second home for me for many reasons. And it's a, it's a very important uh, point for us as Cinity. We love the Japanese audience. I think the Japanese audience respect us for what we do. We have, we have a of, Japanese exactly. Site. We have yeah. uh, Japanese. Uh, we have a site in in the Japanese language. Uh, but the thing is, it's a very long journey, and this time, for the first time ever, I went through Helsinki, and I was very surprised. He Helsinki is such a relaxed airport. I never really. I, I I don't think when was the last time that I've seen such a relaxed. Small airport, airport. You don't Finnish have to, people are relaxed people as well. <laughs> well, in all honesty, I have no clue how the businesses in the airport actually make money because it was literally almost empty. But you were there in the night, no? Still, there is a feeling. You know, you <laughs> yeah. can feel. You can feel how. Yeah, but so that was quite uh, an, a nice journey, uh, all the way to first Helsinki uh, and then uh, continuing to to Tokyo, and. Two things. One is about this journey. I didn't know. I talked to one of the um, uh, uh, air stewardess, and she told me that they actually allowed to work only four days a month when they fly because of the radiation. So that was very interesting to hear uh, that the company is limiting them for the amount of time they can fly, fly between Helsinki and Japan. And the second thing is... Of course, uh, I flew to Tokyo, and I always prefer to go to Haneda. There are two main airports uh, in, in, in Tokyo, and uh, Haneda is the closest one to, to town. It's much easier to commute afterwards. But actually, right after, I went to uh, Yokohama. And that's where CP Plus takes, pl takes place. Originally, this is a show that is more for photographers. That's how it started. It's also small, right? Is it, is it like BSC or bigger? It's a bit bigger than BSC. It's very well organized, like Japanese style, I would say. And uh, but it's one big hall. There, there is not more to it. Yeah. But the thing is, with with uh, the Japanese who are at, who are attending there. First of all, there is much more video content right now. I mean, they do emphasize video in general, which is reflecting how our industry moved from only photo oriented. Uh, mirrorless or DSLRs doesn't matter to uh, more hybrid cameras. So obviously it's being reflected. And the second thing, and that's why I really like this show, almost every company is dedicating, uh, dedicating the time to have some type of workshop. So that they bring their ambassadors or uh, other people to talk about stuff. And it's nice because the Japanese are actually sitting and listening. It's very nice to see that there's a... Um, uh, 
much more than just coming to seeing a gear. There's much more. Yeah, there's more. Everybody's profiting here. So this is CP Plus. It's about, I think, four days, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, weather in Yokohama was all in all quite bad. I'm not used to this, but uh, it's it's uh, it was very great. It was very cold. It was rainy at the time. So being at the on the show floor itself was uh, very nice. And one of the nice things in Japan in general, you have this uh, press room, which is relatively small, but you know that you can leave everything on the table. You can leave your equipment, you can leave your laptop, everything, yeah, which is kind of uh, bring back the uh, the trust in people, yeah, Th that's how it is. And of course, there are also some foreign journalists, but I want to believe that nobody is there to, uh, you know, whatever, like, and, and the funny thing, I, I left a jacket on my, on my, on my chair. And when I came a few hours later, suddenly the jacket was gone, which is so un-Japanese. I was like, what? Where's my jacket? I notified the staff in a nice way saying probably somebody needed it. It was a cold weather outside. And all I know that the next day I had the representative from the press room literally running to me and say, is that the jacket? I mean, somebody thought that I forgot it or somebody forgot the jacket. He brought it to the organizers and I got my jacket back. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, I, I, in these newsrooms, yes, Japan is different in that way that you can, can feel very secure about those things. But I, I have to say in general, uh, also at NAB and IBC, those newsrooms are very well organized. I mean, we feel right at home in a way, right? I mean, it's like, a, it's it's actually quite big spaces. IBC for one one time they had it smaller after COVID, but then it's back to normal and they're very nice to the press. I mean, they need the press in a way, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of our home base at these shows in general. You go there, uh, you have the team sitting there, editing, writing, uh, you can talk, you can bring people in. Sometimes there's even food and drinks. So that's, that's very nice. I mean, it's like on the busyness of the show floor, I think a lot of people don't, they always wonder how we manage to output that much content. But honestly, in the big shows, it's they, this makes it possible. I mean, it's like there's shows like Cinegear where we don't have this, where it's very hard to actually find a space to edit or do anything because they don't have the space. So you need to literally rent a Airbnb, which is close to the Paramount Studios where Cinegear takes place in L.A., which is very, very hard logistically to get stuff out. But yeah. yeah. So with CP Plus, the idea was not to fully cover the show because uh, first it was only, uh, I was alone there. That was the aim. So it's literally filming and editing by myself. Uh, but yeah, I tried to pick up a few topics which are interesting for our audience. And one of those, uh, we ran two interviews kind of off the show. They were not really, really connected, but it was part of me being in Japan. And the first one was with Fujifilm. They just uh, introduced the X106, mm -hmm. which is the successor of the X105. And for those who are not aware of the camera, it's a hybrid camera. It's very small, it's very stylish, and it has a fixed lens. There is no zoom lens. And it has, um, it's a, I think, 23 millimeter lens, and it has a, a built in ND filter. And the new camera, the X1056, already has an IBIS built in too. So it's a combination of IBIS and ND filter, uh, which is nice, but apparently it's also easier to make. It's almost, uh, for, for now, for the current stage, it's much more challenging for the manufacturers to run. Uh, IBIS and ND filter in a interchangeable lens camera. And you actually talked to yeah, two of so their managers? That's right. So I talked to uh, Higarashi-san, and he's the divisional uh, manager at Fujifilm, quite high in the, really high in the in the rank. And Watanabe-san, he's a product planning uh, manager, very capable person. Uh, he's everywhere when it comes to, to, to Fujifilm cameras, actually both of them, because also he, Garashi-san, he is uh, the face of Fujifilm in all those uh, summits and events. So both of them are extremely experienced, very knowledgeable, and I have to say also very nice people to, to, to talk with. Very simple is that. We'll put the link to the interview uh, on our site and YouTube on in the show notes, of course. I mean, you mentioned the camera. What we were surprised about, I mean, this camera, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 
It, like the predecessor was already very popular, right? The X105. Very popular and was almost unavailable. Exactly. It was, very it was hard, to get it. hard to get and yeah. they couldn't fulfill orders for a very long time. I think we were not, or I was at least not so aware of it because I, it's not so video focused, right? It's Well, it's a photo camera with video capabilities. Yeah. So for Fujifilm, the, the orientation is photographers or street photographers. It's a very stylish product. It's very nice. It's when you look at this, it's, yeah. you, you really want. It looks cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool. And you really want to, to have it. But this specific camera uh, already has like a 6.2K video. Mm -hmm. No open gate. I mean, in, in all the honesty, new one, the, the, the new one. X106. Yeah, I mean, you can't, uh, yeah, it has a, a 4K and 4K DCI, 16 by 9. You can uh, rec record video in high quality. The thing is, you have to be aware when you shoot video in the HQ, high, high quality mode, uh, the video will crop. There will be like 1.23 uh, crop into the image. Yeah. And this is in 10 bit. If you don't want the crop, you have to move to the 4K only mode and not use HQ. And then it's 8-bit and you will not have the crop. So, obviously Which, which the, focal length is the fixed one? 23 millimeters. Okay. Uh, so quite wide, actually. It's, it's wide, but of course, if you are using the high quality, the HQ mode, you are cropping a little bit in. And then I personally felt a little bit uncomfortable comfortable kind of I wanted the wide shot so you can't you can't have it all the thing is that uh, it has only one uh, SD card and this SD card is also limited with the speed mm -hmm. uh, that's why they probably ha had to limit the amount of data that comes uh, into the card and that's why you, uh, they, they, there is a crop but please how much is it this is 1,000 500, can I see? Just well, actually, we, uh, we don't have bilings on this one, which is a do. mistake. No, 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 we have. Uh, no. Oh, really? There, there are no bilings. <laughs> That's a mistake. Well, oh, there should okay. be bilings. Yeah. Um, anyway, the so for me, it looks like a like a cheap rangefinder, like a cheap Leica version kind of, right? That's maybe how people perceive it because me it looks cool. Me um, personally, uh, you know, I, I don't like the word cheap. I would say modestly priced. Um, <laughs> but, Inexpensive. Uh, yeah, it's a $1,600 yeah. camera. It is a kind of a range finder. It has an optical uh, viewfinder also. You can uh, change between optical and uh, EVF. It's, I think one thing is for sure. In the past, many people thought that Fujifilm equipment is expensive. And I'm always so surprised to see that they bring high quality products, mm. but in a, at a very affordable price. And this specific uh, camera also have the newest film simulation which is the Reala Ace. It's, it's very nice. Like it's a really out of the box, very nice uh, color. Which was announced with the GFX 102. 102 that's yeah. right. And, and this specific thing will come to future cameras. If I'm not mistaken, uh, they are announced in the previous summit uh, that that will also come to um, uh, other cameras, which is nice to see. Yeah, so I, we, will, we have the camera with us. We will review it. I'm actually very much tempting, uh, tempted to put an anamorphic, a small anamorphic lens on it. Like an adapter. Uh, that's right. And create something a little bit different because I can imagine that there will be a lot of content produced with this camera very, very soon. And we want, want it to look a little bit different. So, yeah, we will check uh, overheating and all of that stuff. Please remember, this is not a video camera. Even in the world of... Mirrorless cameras. Mm. Yeah, it's probably kind of a BC camera. It, it, it just it's just a fun camera. It's just a, I mean, it's small. You can have it on you, and 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 we were surprised. I mean, uh, we kind of have a pulse on the industry. I think with our audience, of course, that it's leaving a lot of comments. But and we saw how people were interested in that video, particularly, but also the announcement of the camera, and and we see how many pre-orders came came in through B and H. Uh, I mean, of course, and we should mention this here. If you really want to support Cinity and what we do, it's always helping us if you click the affiliate links to B&H and CVP. We are, they are our uh, retail partners, uh, CVP for UK and Europe and B&H uh, for US and rest of the world because, you know, like they, they literally sell anything, almost everything. We are very, very close to them because every time there's a new product, you know, like we will actually check with them, do you already have it stocked? And... 
we make sure that the links are there when something is launched, you know, like we do our best, uh, because, you know, like we, it's, it's, it's normal to be, it's good to be affiliated with a retailer because they don't care what they sell as long as they sell. And it doesn't matter for us. We can be honest with our opinions because of that, because we always get a tiny percentage. If you click on something, it helps us to run the show, to pay all the people behind the scenes that, you know, run Synity and it is expensive to do. Um, so please, uh, you know, like click our links, doesn't cost you any cent more. But through this, of course, we saw that uh, this camera is amazingly popular. This is by far, and we checked with different sources. Yeah, this is by far the most pre-ordered camera in recent history, which is of course a bit surprising for us. In like why? Yeah, uh, we saw maybe sometimes a similar behavior when Blackmagic used to announce their mm. own cameras at the beginning a few years ago. But still, even within recent ones. But nothing less. come close to this. This is yeah. I, we don't want to go into numbers because we don't have concrete numbers, but our sources are telling us that they also never saw something like this. Now the question is: Will Fujifilm be able to fulfill the orders? Uh, because I think they were committed to like what fifteen thousand cameras to producing fifteen thousand cameras a month, so that will be very interesting to see. Mm. Another topic that we talked about with... Uh, we have to l look a little bit of the time at the time. Yeah, but yeah. So just very quickly is, will Fujifilm consider and come up with a cinema camera? Since this is a topic that is very interesting for many. I mean, we can see, we also run a, a poll uh, about this and many would love to see a Fujifilm cinema camera. Actually, uh, let me let me show the poll. We ran this poll, I think, last week or the week before. Uh, yeah, should... No, uh, sorry, side. that's the other one. No, no, down on the left-hand side, down. Yeah. Not this one. Whoops. We So we talk about the weekly polls that we yeah. do in a second, but we ran one uh, asking people if they want uh, Fujifilm to come up with a dedicated cinema camera. And if we, uh, let me just uh, say yes here, because I, then I see the results. You, you can you can just click. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, people want <laughs> Fujifilm to do a dedicated cinema camera. So what did, what did they say? <laughs> what did they say? First, no comment. No, no, no. I can't, I can't say no <laughs> comment because I, I, I can only quote what they said. And yeah. what they said is currently there is no uh, dedicated cinema camera. They will consider, and of course, when I showed some uh, disappointment while I was interviewing the gentleman, they said, but this might change tomorrow. Uh-huh. So, you know, I think they are fully aware of what people want. For me personally, it would be very interesting if, if, uh, and it's not that we have the information, if this type of camera will come in the future, how it will be positioned. Because there are already quite a lot of manufacturers who are making film uh, uh, cinema cameras. Well, I like Fujifilm's approach is a bit of a Trojan horse in general, right? Uh, they... They have decided consciously to not make full frame cameras, which is a very interesting decision because, of course, the whole industry was focused on on full frame over the last few years, with especially Sony, Canon, RE, many others, Red, uh, doing full frame cinema cameras. Um, but they said we were not going to do it. So you have either the medium format GFX line large format. and large format, and uh, well, in photo APS. terms, it's medium format, but yeah, it's they call it large format for video and uh, Super 35 uh, APS-C in, in all their others. So that's, I think it's a smart move. It's, like you said, it's very interesting. If they ever come up with a cinema camera, will it be one or the other? That's right. Um, because, of course, the Super 35 cinema camera market is crowded, um, but there's not much on the large format, I guess. So let's see. Yeah, let's see. Let's move on. Uh, just very, very briefly, the second interview we published was with Panasonic. Yeah. What can you tell me about that? So we published another interview with Tsumura-san and Tsumura-san is from Panasonic and he is the uh, executive vice president or, and the director of the imaging business unit. Very nice person also, very knowledgeable. He was actually originally the person behind developing the Panasonic uh, camera phone. That many years ago, Panasonic, actually before time, you know, it's, sometimes it's really about timing when you introduce a product. 
I do believe this gentleman has a vision and part of his vision was, and that's one of the first things that he did was to combine the consumer and the professional departments because acknowledging, of course, that times is changing. And uh, yeah, I mean, what, like it, 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 it can be for the benefit of the business and the consumers to have uh, everything under one roof. The question is, of course, what will happen to the professional line? And that's one of the questions about everyone uh, and um, the Varicam line, line of cameras because those are kind of neglected in the last years. In the interview, I could not get a clear answer what will happen to those lines. But I think if, if, if listening very carefully to him, they are acknowledging the needs. I mean, Panasonic was always a company that put a lot of effort into adding video mm -hmm. components into the cameras. They did it on the micro, micro four thirds line and full frame line. And yeah, I think more will come uh, probably in reason, like, like always, yeah, we know that new cameras will come, but it will be interesting to see what direction the company will take. It's, it's, I always felt a little bit sorry for a lot of those Panasonic products because they were technically so amazing. Uh, if you look at the S1H, for example, which was really, I mean, that was probably the most fully featured uh, mirrorless camera for at video time. at that time. Um, but it was probably in terms of market share, it was too late to the market. And you, at that time, Sony and Canon had already taken so much of that market with the E-mount and then later with EF and RF mount and, and Canon that it was difficult for them to gain a lot of traction. But the people who have those cameras, also the EVA 1, and the S1H or other S5, S5 II, love them. I mean, they are amazing. Yeah. I've started recently shooting a project with where I used the S5 II as a B camera. Uh, and and I only used it first because, you know, I didn't have the right adapter for a Sony camera, actually. But then I, I stuck with it simply because the, the, the sensor stabilization is so amazing in this camera. You can awesome. shoot awesome. handheld with very long focal lengths, anamorphic ones, for example, and, and have amazing stabilization, which is completely impossible, even though other, like with Sony and Canon, even though they also have sensor stabilization, but it's so good in the S5 II. So it's like, like these cameras should actually have much bigger market share than they actually have. Yeah. Well, the Ever One was simply too late to the market. It couldn't compete. Uh, I think the FX6 was already in the market. No, it was wasn't the, FX the FX7. FX7. Seven. Yeah. One of those was no, already was the in the FX7, market. Yeah. Uh, FX5 maybe. A anyway, FS5, it was, it, yeah. it, it was uh, too late to the market. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the S, um, S1H suffered from not having a proper autofocus at that time. Mm. Because, you know, as a one-man one band, you are looking for uh, a tool that can serve you best. And autofocus is one of those uh, features that you really need, uh, even if some people don't like to work with autofocus, but if you work on a gimbal and so on, and you are one-man band, you better have an autofocus. But one of the things that I really wanted to hear from Tsumura san was about his thoughts when it comes to micro four thirds versus full frame. Because as you know, Panasonic is running those two lines. And at the end, it's a, not such a big dedicated team who, who is working on the cameras. So you have somehow to navigate your efforts and, and prioritize what to produce. And I was pleasantly surprised. Obviously, Panasonic is still very much... Uh, behind the micro four thirds format. It seems like they are really, I mean, recently they, they uh, uh, introduced to the market the, the G, the Lumix G92, uh, which is a really, it's a very nice camera. Personally, I think it was a bit too expensive. Like if I compare it to other offerings, I mean, currently you can find actually the S52 at B&H, for example, full frame camera, cheaper, with the micro four thirds. Yeah. So it's a, on a special deal, of course, but it's this deal is running for quite some time. And uh, yeah, I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised to see that they're going to take care of both lines. But if you want to hear more, I think I really, I suggest people to go to, to listen to this uh, interview. And if you have any questions to ask Panasonic or, or Fujifilm, doesn't matter, don't hesitate to drop us a line and we will try to communicate uh, whatever you guys are asking and please understand, it's not uh, some of the comments like, why didn't you ask about this and this particular camera? Simply because in Japanese mentality, they will not 
talk about a specific camera. There's so many things going, uh, uh, you know, for example, let's presume that there's a camera with whatever feature. Maybe this feature is patented. Maybe you have to make sure that all the clearance is being achieved first. So you, they can't talk about individual cameras and features before they are exposed to the market. Yeah, so it's better always to ask in general about trends and about uh, what they think about things than going into particular products because the chances that they will answer about upcoming particular products is almost zero. Yeah, it's a, it's a very naive assumption that, you know, like what's the next cinema camera? Of course, nobody's going to tell you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, exactly. They, they can talk about trends and we can already assume what's coming. Um, you mentioned contacting us. That's actually a good point. We encourage you to email questions to podcast at cinedy.com. We have a new email address that's dedicated that uh, colleague Alex and I are monitoring. So any any feedback that comes in, please just drop us a line, you know, like, positive negative what do you think about the podcast what you can we can do better but also questions um that you have to ask to the cnd team uh we're happy to look all of at all of them and answer as many as we can okay let's move on to the poll of this week which is which editing software are you currently using that's of course a very interesting topic because we know that um da vinci resolve has been gaining traction a lot over the last few years uh, it's free. I mean, the basic version is free and the basic version is already very, very capable. Uh, you, I think a full, what, Alex, what is a, the full license is what? $300? Yeah, $300 for the studio license that can literally do anything. Um, and then you get it for free with almost all of their cinema cameras exactly. and a lot of their other products. So it's like a lot of people already have it. Uh, I think you can use it on two computers at the same time. And, th and so far, they have never charged for updates as well. So it's literally almost given away for free, even the pro version. And it's an incredibly capable piece of software. Now, it's coming from coloring, right? It's originally a color suite that Blackmagic acquired and then integrated. And then they put NLE functions on top. Um, it's a complex piece of software. I think a lot of people are are intimidated. looking intimidated. Uh, it, it includes us, right? I mean, you are interested in using it for editing, fully fledged editing, and um, but when you use it, when you start using it, you realize it's not that complex. Even if you stay within the editing ecosystem with of the software, you don't even have to touch Fusion or uh, the color page and stuff like that. Um, it's it's it is. It's not, I wouldn't say intuitive, but it's learnable and uh, it, it's really a fully fledged NLE. It's not something that's an afterthought. That's what a lot of people think. But we see it's very interesting in the poll. Uh, we already have, I mean, now, right now, I mean, we published this yesterday, 750 votes were cast. We're also going to put the link in the show notes so you can also vote. Um, DaVinci Resolve, over 50% of the people who voted uh, are using DaVinci. Around 23 Two percent are using Premiere. Uh, Eighteen or nineteen percent are using Final Cut, which is surprising, also by the way, to see is Final it? Cut kind of being still well, pretty I, much almost at the same extent of Adobe. I, I didn't uh, Premiere. I didn't expect so many people. I I think Premiere. I think uh, you know when 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 Apple. For me personally, I use. I don't edit that much, but when I do edit, I use Final Cut most of the time because it's the fastest in and out thing for me. It runs, even on older Macs, it runs incredibly performant. Of course, it has, it got a bad image in the beginning. I think Apple shouldn't have called it Final Cut Pro, Final Cut Pro X in the beginning, because the original Final Cut Pro has nothing to do with a new one. So people were really expecting an updated version when it was something completely new. If they had called it video editing version 1.0, nobody would have, you know, like complained. complained. But the problem was they, they kind of, stopped support for the old one, which was really a high-end professional piece of software that all of us used and kind of pissed people off by doing that. And then over the next 10 years, 12 years, whatever, when it was released, they made it into something very, very capable. Um, and also, I mean, they charge, what, 250 euros for this once or dollars and then never again charged anything for it. Any major update was free. And then compare this to Premiere, where you have to pay a monthly or annual fee 
to Adobe and it's really expensive in comparison. Yeah. The problem is for me personally, because I, I'm still on uh, Adobe Premiere uh, Pro. The thing is when you have a project, you, you want to get it done as fast as possible. So you obviously, or I obviously go to the editing platform that I know because I can edit Premiere by now, like uh, closed eyes, yeah? And then, so you need the time to learn. And the thing is, you don't always have the time. It's, it's a time thing. So I find myself always going back to what I know. It's a habit, of course. And uh, I, I was one of those naive people that went into Final Cut when it was released and it was disappointed. I stuck with it and kind of at that time I was also pivoting to Premiere. What always frustrated me about Premiere extra incredibly was that it's like a copy of the original Final Cut Pro, right? They tried to, like everything, there was in the old days, there was a Premiere that was comp that was different, right? And then they, that was horrible. I mean, that was when I was in film school, it was really bad. It was very buggy. It would, it, I, it was- but Computers were also not Yeah, so but still, it was not very stable. And then at, at some point Adobe cut it. And once they, they kind of redeveloped it from scratch, and of course, they looked at the more popular solution, which at the time was the original Final Cut Pro, which the last version, I think, was 7, uh, when they stopped supporting it. And a lot of that was kind of copied over. So if you knew the old Final Cut, you knew the new Premiere. And in a way, of course, they added more and more functions, and Adobe is very good at adding new features. But I think because of how they work with this subscription... They don't, they don't always do a good job at maintaining what's there. They add new stuff on top and sometimes that's to the detriment of what's there. And that's what frustrated me. And, and, and that means also the way it works is, is, is archaic for me. It's like you open a premiere and it feels like the old final cuts. And, um, that also goes, I mean, performance got a lot better with, uh, GPU support, of course, but still, if you compare the performance of. Well, the kind of computer you need, uh, I mean, the computer is not the limiting factor anymore, right? I mean, if you have a modern, uh, if we are on Mac, so if you're on an M, M1, M2, M3, uh, any of those computers are fast enough to edit 4K video easily. Um, if you're still on Intel, it still makes a huge difference what graphics card you're using and stuff like that. But Premiere will always be a more power hungry uh, thing. It will drain the battery faster if you're running on battery on a plane or whatever. And... Uh, Final Cut and Da Vinci, but especially Final Cut is just much more performant. And and they rethought, I mean, that's the thing, you know, like Apple at the time, they really rethought the editing process. And that's that's what annoyed a lot of people because we are habit creatures in a way, especially editors. Uh, so they changed everything and called it the same as before. So that annoyed everybody. And Premiere kind of gave the you a safe haven. If you were on Final Cut before, you could easily transfer to Premiere Pro and it's almost the same. Uh, and it's to this very day. But I think now I feel it's a little bit outdated almost. Uh, if you look at how it works, um, it's fine. <laughs> but it's like the whole mechanisms of things you can... I, I, I promise you if I edit the same or if somebody who knows both softwares identically, Premiere Pro and Final Cut... They will be a lot faster with Final Cut in, yeah, sure. in 90% of the cases. You can do cases. three clicks in one. You can do probably with one click on the other. Yeah. But the thing is, I, I, again, for the for the sake of conversation, I have to say that Adobe got much better in recent years. They have this better version that you can download and you can work with. Uh, that was unheard before. Yeah, like releasing or giving people to work with better version, and not only that, you can communicate almost directly and let them know about bugs. And they are, they are reading those comments. We did quite a few years ago, like a, a factory tour at Adobe, which was very nice and, and, and in, in, interesting and uh, informative. And they they are reading the comments. Yeah, they they watching. But of course, it's it's a completely different thing. It's a different business orientation, like in terms of subscription versus one time uh, purchase and so on. Yeah. So. So yeah, the, you mentioned the factory tour. So here it is. Uh, this you did this in what 2018? Uh, that was before COVID. So a behind the scenes documentary of Adobe. Yeah. I don't even know if some of the locations still if they are still there. I have no clue. I mean, uh, yeah. that was done quite some time ago. But it was an experience because 
at the end, Adobe is a giant. And I think many people find it a bit hard to associate themselves with uh, like giants like, like Adobe. Yeah? So it was interesting to, uh, to, 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 to meet the people behind because all of those factory tours, that's, that's the purpose, to meet the people behind the logo, behind the brand. Yeah? Yeah. So again, if you watch this, it's a very nice documentary, mini documentary. A lot of effort went into this, but I'm not so sure if all of those locations are still valid. I have no clue if they moved and, and yeah, whatever. All right, so yeah. that's the poll of the week. We run a new poll every week. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll put the link to the poll in the show notes and we'll also put the link to the uh, Adobe factory tour there. We talked a lot about this now. Uh, everybody has their preference. I think that um, you know there's room for all of this. But if we're all honest, I think I think a lot of people who are on Premiere and Final Cut are looking at the Da Vinci. Yeah, because it's simply in both the low end and the high end, uh, really gaining traction. And you see almost Avid has become like a afterthought. I mean, that's really, it used to be the dominant thing in broadcast and filmmaker. I, I think in high end, it still might be. Um, but a lot of the, every time I, I mean, I learned Avid a little bit in, in university, but it's like, it felt very, it felt like shackles, right? You can't, it's very hard to do things like titles and and integrate other things. It's it's, it's very very if you do like a streamlined thing from A to Z and do this regularly, I think there is still a lot of people using Avid because it's like it's giving you this process that it's absolutely streamlined. But as soon as you do something out of the box, you're very limited. That's what I have feeling. But honestly, the last time I touched it was a long time ago. So yeah. maybe that changed. But we see in terms of market share and, and also in our poll that it's not very popular with independent filmmakers for sure. That's right. Um, and um, yeah, and a lot of people are looking at Da Vinci because they're doing a lot of, Black, Black Magic is doing a lot of things right. Okay, let's move on to something else. We have the uh, our education platform, MZ which has been part of the Cinity family for almost three years now. Um, MZ, what is MZ? MZ is a platform that right now has over 50 courses, 54, 55, I think, totaling over 500 hours and, and 900 or eight, 900 lessons uh, of amazing filmmaking content. I mean, we have some of the best educators in the world on that platform teaching you cinematography, lighting, uh, editing, producing, anything cinema sound uh podcasting you know like we have a podcasting course so a lot of stuff and one of the, our corporation partners um we we cooperate with ari so the ari academy actually runs through mz for example if you buy an ari camera um you can you know learn how to use your camera uh through uh, mz courses from ari um but also the asc the american society of cinematographers that's a corporation we're very proud of. Um, I mean, it's, it's the oldest cinematography organization in the world, over 100 years old. And of course, um, the most prestigious one, uh, some of the best cinematographers in the world are ASC members. And it's very, it's in a, in a way an, an elite club, but they're very, very focused on education. They're very, very focused on outgoing and, and sharing their knowledge. There's the American Cinematographer magazine, an amazing magazine that comes out every month. Uh, that shares stories from the best, the biggest sets in the world. And really, you know, that the cool thing, and, you know, like our friend Terry McCarthy, the CEO of the ASC, actually uh, told me once that, you know, the cool thing about cinematographers is that they're a very outgoing bunch. You know, they're very cooperative. That's very different from some other uh, branches in our industry where, you know, like, I guess, producers and maybe even directors are a little bit more protective of their stuff because maybe they fear that somebody else might steal their idea cinematographers are very chatty they are like to share what they do because uh you know it's all about the visuals and 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 that's you know one of the nice things we like about all those events whether it's uh industry trade shows or film festivals all that you know that you know that's really outgoing um and the asc is really spearheading that effort i would say they have they have a lot of educational stuff going on they also have a really good podcast um, and they have their asc clubhouse conversations which is a regular format that we have on mz we're the only organization outside of the asc that's actually um, accepted to share those clubhouse conversations we have 
over 160 hours out of the MZ content is the Clubhouse Conversations. Some of the Oscar-nominated uh, movies were just added, you know, like discussions about the latest and greatest that are being awarded in a couple of days. Um, that's all there, you know, that, that's part of MZ. And we also not only have content from them that they produce, we've also produced content with them. Um, there has been an event in Austria uh, a while ago, which is the Jackson Wild Summit, actually originally in Jackson Hole, Wyoming in the US. That's the mo one of the two most prestigious wildlife filmmaking uh, festivals. And they came to Austria a while ago and did one version of that here. And the ASC organized some workshops, like a cinematography lab there. And... Uh, cinema like young filmmakers not only cinematographers but also directors like a group of 10 12 was flown in from all over the world a very very diverse crew a lot from africa asia us europe everywhere uh, were flown in um, and had a couple of days course on wildlife filmmaking that wildlife filmmaking course is for free on mz we're going to put the link in the show notes below you can just create a free account on MZ and watch that entire thing for free. Uh, we invested a lot of into producing and editing this. Um, and as agreed with the ASC, it's free for everybody. As part of that uh, Wild Love workshop, there was also a lighting workshop, which we separated and made a separate course out of this. Now, this is part of um, MZ Pro, so our subscription. If you are a subscriber, you have access to those 50 plus courses and those five hours, 500 hours of courses and also this new course which is actually launched today it's a four hour course by paul atkins uh, and stephen lighthill asc stephen is the former president of the asc and paul atkins is one of the most renowned uh, wildlife cinematographers in the world he done a lot of work with um uh you know like bbc and and uh, some of the biggest names in in wildlife filmmaking and this is a really cool course because it's an on-location course. They did, each each of them did one-hour sessions indoor and outdoor. So there's a one-hour session indoor by Stephen and a separate one by Paul. And then one and another one of uh, outdoor lighting uh, by Stephen and Paul. So in total, it's a four-hour course and it's very, very hands-on. You know, like it's it's the, that group of filmmakers that are actually asking questions. They set up a scene. They explain how they decide where to put somebody. And it's really about on location. So we're both documentary filmmakers. It's an extremely useful piece of information. It's like, you know, you come into a room. Where do you put the, uh, the people? Where do you put the lighting to make it look the best and to support the story? And this is what this new course is about. It's called Lighting People on Location, Indoors and Outdoors. And it's available as a separate course purchase or as part of our MZ Pro annual subscription. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a little bit of an ad here, but it's really amazing. I mean, we produced this. I shot this myself together with our friend Jacob. Uh, we were there and it was just a really, really cool experience. I love how these guys are so open to share their knowledge. And, you know, that it's, it's, giving, it's giving so much back uh, also to them, I think. That's why they love to do that. All right, let's move on to the last topic of the day, which is, of course, AI. People love AI. AI. Now, yeah, we, we, we have been called AI propagandists by commenters on CineD. Uh, since the beginning of, of this whole AI craze in terms of generative images, we've tried to stay on top of this wave uh, because I think a lot of people in our field kind of neglect it now because they're scared of it. What's your take? It is frightening in some ways, but I really do feel that we need to get to know the monster better in order to control it. For sure, there will be those who might have to change career, but it doesn't mean that, the, that it's always a bad thing. I mean, I, let, me, let me try to, of course, if somebody will say, hey, but you might lose your job this will create other opportunities. So first of all, it's really about reporting what's happening. So we're all knowledgeable, not that we wake up one morning and suddenly there's, okay, what happened to my, to my profession or to my job? That's one thing. And the second thing is just to start to think 
what can I do in order to stay relevant? And this is uh, that for all of us. Yeah, it's not like uh, it's not the guys out there because we are also working professionals. One thing is for sure, we will not be able to stop this progress. And we've seen already in our industry in the past, things has changed dramatically and there were always those who were like kind of uh, really, really, of course, scared of a change. Nobody liked those fundamental changes. And the scary thing with this particular one that it's happening very, very fast. So the only thing that I can suggest, and I'm sure that you will agree with me, is first of all, actually to read as much and watch as much as possible to understand the impact and then try to think how how this can in some ways serve us and if that means that some parts of our industry will literally die there is still enough time to train ourselves to move into things that that probably will not touch or for, for example must be a way I mean it's not that suddenly all of us will be unemployed here so there is fear, there is some, um, and we, we don't really know what the future will bring. One thing is for sure, this is moving very fast, even faster than expected, honestly. Absolutely. I mean, I've um, tried to use MidJourney, the image generator, since, what, one and a half, two years now, just to monitor this, how it evolves. And like you said, the, the, the speed of the progress is absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, we... we the, the first time I used it was the images were, you know, like you could see that it was something generated. There were a lot of mistakes and, and it was very, very far from any anything photorealistic. But as more as you play with it, you, and I, like you said, I can only recommend people to try it themselves because you will understand its limitations as well. Um, it's, uh, it's evolved incredibly fast. And now if you generate images uh, with it now, uh, like and mid journey is for static images only. Um, you will realize that it's um, it's it's photorealistic. I mean, it literally, is photorealistic now. It's it's something you cannot discern from a real photo anymore. So I did a presentation on AI, and here's an image that I generated. I with. know this guy. <laughs> oh, actually, it doesn't exist. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So the latest version of MidJourney specifically is incredible. I mean, it's still 6.0 alpha version. Um, I think I put a text prompt, something like, you know, generate me a guy looking at a computer being desperate or something. And it always comes up with four different versions and then you can modify them. You know, like, I mean, these looks, if you see the, you see these things like that, it, you would not be able to tell that it's not a real photo anymore yeah. and that's scary uh, now this is static images I mean there's also stuff like this which is even more scary um, this is completely computer generated I put something like you know like the current proper most likely presidential candidates in the US opposing each other and you get stuff like that and I mean you have to look very closely to see that this is not a real photo it's completely generated uh, they are trying to prevent these things uh, because of course that really opens every door for fake news. Um, yeah, and I, and I, do, I really don't want to touch that specific topic about how to control yeah. because we know it has to be controlled. How that will be done, it's really beyond our capabilities and power, of course. So, but um, the scary thing, I mean, there's AI touches many different things, and I, I think we can share here that we are working. We have been working with our. Uh, one of our esteemed members from the team, Masha, she's Masha Dekova. She's working on an ebook with us uh, about AI tools for filmmakers to actually do exactly what you said, to use them to your benefit, right? To really target it at filmmakers and 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 get more productivity out of these tools, and not think about how is it gonna affect like negatively my job, but how is it gonna help me positively to do my work better and more efficiently because there's many AI is such a wide field. It's become this buzzword, but it's so many different things. And the, the thing that people are mostly scared about is, is those image generators in general, understandably, but there's a lot of other fields and it will affect the entire world and the society as a whole um, for many jobs. 
Um, but there are a lot of tools that will make your life easier. And we are, we are working on this. It's going to be a very extensive ebook that people can subscribe to because it's going to be something that it's going to be frequently updated because new stuff is coming all the time. You mean by the time that you finish to read, you have to update? Yes. <laughs> the plan is to update it once a month okay. with all the new stuff. And uh, that's why it needs to be, you need to be a Thank subscriber you. in order to get the latest version. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. Uh, and we're also going to, after that, work on a MZ course on uh, image generators specifically and some of the productivity tools as well. It's just really, because the field is so vast, I think you, it's easy to get lost. And 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 uh, last week, I actually, Masha gave a very nice presentation at a local video bar camp here in Vienna uh, for Cinity. And um, I learned a lot that I didn't know. You know, like she showed so many productivity tools that make your life easier. So, and that's all going to be part of that ebook and the course, but more on that later. But let's move on with image generators. So there, of course, uh, OpenAI, the, you know, like the company that has pioneered JetGPT, um, that has actually started this whole craze and public awareness of AI. That's really been out there for a long time, but that has shown the world what it's capable of. They launched Sora, or at least showed a preview of Sora, which is an AI video generator that is really capable, as the title of our article says here, which is linked in the show notes below, uh, of shocking realism. I mean, you can see clips here that look like real clips uh, that are completely computer generated. I mean, this you would not be able to discern from an actual drone shot. Um, uh, there is a whole movie trailer that they generated just with text prompts. Now, Sora, this technology is not available yet in public. Like you cannot like Midjourney or uh, JetGPT or Dolly, which is the static image generated by OpenAI. You cannot access it yet um, publicly. Um, but on X or Twitter, uh, you see lots of examples of people who do have beta or alpha access that showing more and more impressive uh, things that are you know, like, I mean, here's some mistakes that it actually makes. Uh, it's all, again, based on text prompts. They also share those prompts. If you follow Sam Altman, the CEO of uh, OpenAI in, on, on X, you will see a lot of examples that he shares. So people will send him and his team um, text prompts, and then sometimes he publishes them, uh, what, what comes out of it. It's, it's, it's scary. And the scary thing is, the realism, right? I mean, some of those videos, they look absolutely real. Now, but the trouble is, and that's, you know, like it's a really long introduction to where I wanted to go. Sora has been released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the problem with all those image generators is consistency, right? You, you put in vague text prompts and you get some results. How, it's not scary, like, like not really threatening <laughs> our industry, as long as you cannot have consistency, meaning to make a film, you need a lot of different clips, a lot of different scenes with the same characters, same objects, some locations uh, in order to make sense of this. Now, there's something really new now, which is actually using different uh, AI models, both open and closed ones, and combines them into something new. And it's called LTX Studio. I think that's an Israeli company that has pioneered this um, and it allows you to, I will just play this video, um, it will allow you to have re, how should I say, re, tell re, a story in a way. Tell a story. I mean, you can, you can regenerate the same character um, and have a real storyboard. I mean, it's like generate a movie you know, generate me a courtroom drama in New York. I think that's what it says here. And then, yeah, can you make the car red? Can you use the same character in various settings? Um, you know, all that. It's really optimized for this storyboarding. And and that's that's impressive. I mean, you see some examples on their website. This literally just launched. Um, it's not open. You can sign up on their website for um, closed beta testing. I did already. I hope we'll get access soon to try it ourselves. The image quality is not as good as Sora showed, um, but just the usability is amazing. And of course, um, we, just know, we know how fast the image quality will get better. Exactly. 
I mean, it's it's really impressive, and it seems to be really focused on on oops, uh, filmmakers, right? Um, it's like you know, shot shot by shot, it's like storyboard everything. Uh, that's 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 scary in a way. Um, well, let's see. I mean, I think the first industries that will suffer from from AI is uh, stock footage. Because usually you buy individual stock clips and if you can generate them on a computer. And it's not only... It, I think those those platforms are already flooded by AI-generated images and, and some of them allow and some prohibit actually to, to submit them. But they cannot sometimes discern them from real images anymore. So I'm sure if you look at something like Shutterstock or iStock and, and Adobe Stock, uh, you will already have lots of... AI generated images there without the platform knowing, which means people will buy this, people will use it, and you will see it. I actually see, because I think I know, especially the older versions of Mid Journey and what the images look like, there are some characteristics that are very hard to put in words, but you will recognize them if you use it a lot. And I've seen posters on the street by McDonald's and others that used their images and they've not talked about it. You know, like either the client doesn't know, maybe they know. Maybe the agency knows, you know, it's like, it's very hard. Maybe they don't even know if they use a stock image. That's crazy. Like it's, you, you, they might not even be aware that it's, that the stock image they purchase is not a real image. It's scary. And, um, and there is, of course, there needs to be regulation to mark those images. Uh, but I think so far there is, it's very, it's just visible watermarks on those things that are very easy to remove with AI. <laughs> you know, like you have you have Photoshop and all those uh, generative things that now can very easily remove watermarks. So it's 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 that is that is scary in a way because you will not be able very soon to to know if you even buy something that is real. That that's that's the immediate danger that I see with this. Yeah. We're just watching right now <laughs> because I don't even want to name like name names and also predict which industries will suffer the biggest first. I want to believe that those big agencies will try to reinvent themselves into some extent. They will have to. You know, but you know, th those are big giants. And of course, we've already seen in the past what happened when the industry moved from normal mobile phones to, let's say, iPhone, what happened to a giant in the past. So yeah, I really wonder, today is what? The 29th of February. February 2024. In a year from now, when we still talk in this podcast. There is no in a year from now because oh, there's course, not going to be 29. <laughs> oh, of course. In four years. Imagine, <laughs> imagine if you were born in this day. 28th of February, we have a date yeah. with you guys and to check where we are at a year from now with what industries really suffered the most and where is AI then? That would be very interesting. It's a good point. Let's Let's check. Good. Yeah. Okay. okay, that's a nice and very sad way to end the first episode. Well, but it's... Well, <laughs> it's a reality that we have to think hard how to combat in a positive way. All right. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Nino. The first hour of our podcast. Uh, thank you, Alex, behind the scenes, who's our podcast wizard and producer. And thank you guys for listening. Without you, this podcast probably will go nowhere. So we are very happy... Yeah. If you are listening or if you're watching and really drop us a line because we just want to do better. That's, uh, you know, it's a marathon, as we said, and yep. it's another milestone for us. So give us a feedback. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you, guys.